Jess, thanks for joining me today, friend. Thanks for having me here. So um, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction to this particular episode. Um, you and I have been friends for several years now, and that's been a delight and a gift to me in many ways. And so I'm excited to have you on for that reason. And uh, recently, over the last year or so, you've sort of started a new a new project that I want to feature in this episode is uh, working on psychiatric care reform. And I want to hear about that and talk to you about that. But part of the reason that this project is so interesting to me is who you are and the gifts that you're bringing to that project. And so, you know, it'll probably be later in the conversation that we'll talk about that. And, and I want to frame that from getting a sense of who you are. Um, and also just to sort of surface for the, the listeners, you've been sick recently. So your voice is sort of lower than usual and we wanna make sure to take care of your voice and talk about these really important topics. So yeah, um, yeah that's just sort of an introduction for whoever's watching or listening of, of the kind of context here. Um, yeah, so maybe just to get started, uh, would you mind introducing yourself and answering the question that I ask everyone at the beginning, which is, what's your life story? What's your background? Where have you been so far in your life? Yeah, so I'm Jess, um, Jessica Watson Miller, and I uh, was born in Australia to uh, an American mom and Australian dad. And I've been in the Bay for a couple of years um, and I'm trying to work out what parts of my life story are relevant. Uh, I'm an eldest daughter uh, and I feel like that is very much part of who I am and I uh, have been an artist, I've run a circus, I've been a body painter and uh, I've also been in business and um, been project manager, product manager. Uh, I write a lot, I sing a lot, and uh, now I'm trying to do something uh, newer to me, which is uh, doing a project that is pretty intent on making a big change in the world. Uh, and is also very pragmatic. So that's the uh, psychiatric crisis care project that Tashin mentioned before. Um, other things about me. I find it difficult to describe who I am because almost any description I could give you, I the tr the opposite is also true. Um, and so I'm a very loud person, but also today I'm a very quiet person. <laughs> And I'm someone who has a lot of energy and is also often very sleepy or slow. Um, I uh, care a lot about and have thought a lot about economics and incentive design and all of the fancy Twitter words. Um, and I also, uh, you know, grew up as a dancer and a singer and. Um, and an artist. Um, so I guess a lot of my life has been uh, having a, a bunch of opposite characteristics and figuring out how to uh, integrate them. And I guess one of the things that Tashin and I bonded over or, or have in common is um, our spiritual paths. And when we met I was very insistent on a like sex and fire tantra path and he was very insistent on a monastic path and I feel like we've sort of headed <laughs> towards each other over the years. Mm -hmm. um, but that's been very important to me too in particular in the last few years um, when life has changed a lot. I've spent a lot of it practicing, trying to practice, coming back to practice, trying different practices, both um, attention practices and somatic practices. Um, 
guess that's a collection of facts about me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if there are any that are missing mm -hmm. or, yeah. No, that's really helpful. It's very broad overview. And uh, I think I'm reminded that there's so much that I appreciate about you as a person and as my friend and one of like really the core qualities of that is how multifaceted you are and um you know like yeah we've really connected over a spiritual path but you're also like a very worldly person and like embodied person and mm -hmm. you know your intellectual skills are, are incredible and i've learned a lot from your example and also uh you know you're not foregoing other aspects of life for that you know the the you know, real connections with real people or really engaging in your life. And I think it's just such a, you know, you, you've had such a fascinating array of life experiences and skills that you've built. And, you know, it's an uncommon set of uh, skills and experiences that you bring to your life that like I've learned a lot from your example. And so um, I think this will be a pretty wide ranging conversation, but that's like part of the like beauty of who you are, I think. And so I really want to put that on display in this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could tell a reason I came onto the podcast. I'm like, ah, look, I get someone to say wonderful things about me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, which is pretty nice. No shortage of that for me. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So maybe just to begin with some questions, I think when I met you, you were in, we were, in, we met in the Bay and, mm. you know, there's sort of a chapter of your life before I met you that I'd be really curious to hear about where, you know, you said you were helping to run a circus and I know you're involved in body painting. And those are things that not only do I generally not know much about, but I also don't know too much except by like inference or things you've said over the years about what that was like for you. So can you paint a picture of that period of your life and what your involvement with those things was like and, and what that meant to you? Yeah. Um, so, um, when I was a teenager or actually as, as a kid, I was doing a lot of, um, performing. Uh, so I was, I was a dancer, although I was like not the prototypical dancer. So I was sort of like a bit of a crappy dancer for many, many, many years, like 13 years or something. And you did ballet, right? Yeah, I did like ballet, jazz, tap. Mm -hmm. Like I, I still have memories of like my Tuesday after. Uh, your sorry, you're breaking up. Your Tuesday what? Go from like a, a tap class to a jazz class to a ballet class after mm -hmm. school. Like that was just a big part of, um, of of my childhood, and and also music was. Um, I was uh, a singer and I would do competitions and um, also like sang in a choir. And I had this really important music teacher who I think um, motivated me a lot to, to make music. She was like very, very, very encouraging, Mrs. Benson. Mm. Um, and I'd been like a drama kid you know, did plays and all that sort of thing. And when I went to university, well, actually backing up, um, I think when I was around 16, maybe younger, probably, probably like 12 to like 24 or something, I had this real preoccupation with being like unique or special. Like I really wanted to do things that like nobody else was doing. Um, and in an art class, um, we had to do like a big final project um, to graduate. And I remembered like finding something about this festival, this body painting festival in Europe and looking at the pictures and thinking like, I'm going to do that. And I'm pretty sure it was because I was like, nobody else is going to do that. Guaranteed. Like I will be the only person doing body painting in like this entire, like in the whole state or something. Um, and so I like, I did a body paint for this like major work, which was like the end of the year. And it was a film and like, 
extremely pretentious <laughs> like uh, attempt at art house that was that was very cringeworthy but it was um you know I, I went very well and they gave it the good marks I knew how to get the good marks and stuff um but I, the year after that I was sort of like really gunning to like get out I like wanted to escape escape and explore and and I um I was 17 when I graduated high school and a lot of people in Australia do like a gap year. So you just take a year off before you go to university. And um, I did that and I went to Europe um, for part of it. And the festival that I'd, I had um, like been Googling when I was, uh, when I was doing my art project um, was like, it was there, it was in Austria, I could just go to it. And so I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go to it. And um, again, I was, I was 17, I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I like arrived in, in Austria um, and like stayed with a guy who was twice my age, who I had met in Germany at a different festival like in this tiny little like part of rural Austria when nobody spoke English. Like it was the confidence with which I like walked into this random situation was, um, it was a lot. But uh, I just, I really um, was in awe of this community of people. Um, like, I somehow got to meet like the best body painters in the world and they were like these hot shots and I think they really enjoyed being the hot shots as well and uh, I learned how to face paint because I had been learning how to face paint at one of the workshops but um, I went home and I'm like oh I'm not gonna not gonna do it um, but there was like a competition in my area and someone I'd met there told me about it and I ended up going and competing and um, so that ended up, it, it was it's sort of two things. One was I worked out that I could make pretty good money face painting. And like that was better than like working like eight, 10 hour days as a salesperson in a, a phone store, which is what I was doing before. So it was great. Um, and then the second thing was um, I was just, like these people were so cool and I could uh, do these competitions and they had them like, I think right about when I went, got involved, they had just started up some Australian national championships and I just got very good at it very quickly and started winning all of the competitions. And um, it was really fun. Like it was, it was something where like the challenge was very bounded and yet it was very creative. Like a body painting competition is, um, you're generally painting someone, often a female model, um, like head to toe, and you've got some sort of theme or something, and so there's lots of different creative elements. And I wasn't necessarily that good at visual art to start with. Like, I didn't think of myself as a visual artist, um, but I think I was very competitive. <laughs> and so I, um, I really enjoyed the time pressure of, um, <clears throat> of having to get it done in that time. Um, <clears throat> and so for a long time, uh, a lot of my life, particularly my like saving up money and stuff had to do with these competitions. I would save up and I would go to Europe, um, for, to Austria, to this festival every year. And I would try and compete. Um, I would go to Melbourne in Australia and, and go and compete. Um, and I, I, I think one of the reasons I was so into it, aside from the fact that I was really competitive was that I pretty quickly found people that I just like really adored or I really admired and um I was very young and they were all like a lot of them were like willing to mentor this young person um and so yeah I um in particular there was one one artist from uh New Zealand who I was I became very close to and and I just like looked up to her ridiculously like if she'd said something was good I was like 
on cloud nine for days. Um, so yeah, like that was, I sort of, body painting was very surprising. Like it's, it's a very, it's a very niche community. I didn't really expect to like to pick that as a thing. There were so many other things I had been doing, but I think it was like, I, I got surprisingly good at it surprisingly quickly. And I think partially because it tends to draw people who are very, um, touchy feely, very open, very like artistic, but a lot of the competition stuff, you can actually get a long way by being pretty analytical and pretty like systematizing. So like I would do a lot of analysis of like, I would take all of the, the pieces that had like won some competition in the last like several years and I would analyze them and like go like, wh why did that one win and, and not get like, you know, not that one. And I just don't think anyone would, was doing that or, or like there weren't that many people doing it at the time. Um, and so, yeah, like it was, it was nice to keep being pretty successful at it. Um, and also like to feel like I was like constantly getting better. Um, and then circus was like sort of intertwined. Um, at the beginning of university, I like r went to joined one of the clubs, um, like the circus club, uh, in part because they had a face painter there and we bonded over it. Um, but, uh, one of my first experiences was being in someone else's circus show and it was a dumpster fire. It was incredibly badly organized and the director never came to see any of our rehearsals and no one knew what they were doing. And we just like pulled it together through like by the skin of our teeth. And, um, and I remember thinking like, wow, this was like so badly organized. Like I could do it better. And, <laughs> um, and so I started, um, directing and, and, um, producing circus shows. Um, and mostly they were like with the university circus society. Um, but then I also started, um, I had this idea one time, um, to do, to like combine black light body painting, which is just like neon glow in the dark, not glow in the dark. It glows under UV light body painting, um, with circus. And yeah, like that, was something I started on my own, but then pretty quickly, like I did a first season and it went really well and I had a bunch of friends that were involved. And then the next season, this girl came along and said like, Hey, I'd like to be your producer. And I'd met her before and I was like, yeah, you're really cool. <laughs> and, um, and she did. And then we, we, I think because of the relationship with her, we could keep going. Her name was Lauren. Um, and she was just like way more like uh, of an organizer than me. I would be like, I want to do these 500 things. And she's like, okay, but what are the five things you're doing right now? And, and we just had, we had a really good like split of like what we were responsible for. And, um, and she was really driven and that really pushed me to be more driven. Um, and yeah, I did that for, we did like four versions of it. I don't know how many seasons, maybe like eight or something um, over like four or five years. And every time we did it, we like, it got bigger and bigger. Um, and in both cases, I think I reached the limits of the like, I'm doing this thing because it'll make me special, like plan. Like got to the point where like, it was getting sort of boring to introduce myself as the director of like a circus that was like unique in the world because we were running into problems where like we couldn't hire people because no one had done the things that we were doing. I didn't know how to tell stories in that. And there was no one who could teach me because no one had done it before. Um, and at the time I was starting to learn about effective altruism and like had this like giant amount of guilt, like shit, am I really going to spend my life like making glowy shit? Like, is that what I'm doing? Um, and, um, yeah. Um, and, and then the same with the body painting 
um, I like kept going back to the World Body Painting Festival and it's going to sound very like, um, not childish, but like, like, uh, that's selfish is not the right word. I'm not sure what the word is, but like I kept getting, I couldn't get higher than fourth. Like I went back and I got like, I got like 10th and then fourth and then fifth and then fourth or something like four years in a row. And I was just, and the thing was, if you got third or above, you got to go on stage and there was like a prize and like everybody saw it and, and it mm. never happened. <laughs> And, and so even though people were like, wow, you're so good at this thing. I was like, yeah, but it sucks. Cause I don't have that one, you know, I was, I was, I was really doing it to win. And so if I didn't win, then there wasn't a point to doing it. Like it wasn't creation for its own sake or something. Um, <clears throat> and then with the show, it was a little bit more complicated than that. It was like, I was like, you know, people was, was saying like, you need to have a story. It needs to be more something, you know, like the, the thing that, that like directors and actors know when they want to pull you in and, and like help you feel something like everyone was like, it needs to have that. But I just like, couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I was like too scared to, to like, I didn't have an environment where I could learn how to take risks as a director. Like I was the youngest person in my company. Um, <clears throat> and and plus I was like, maybe all of this bullshit is stupid anyways, because like effective altruism and I should go and like, I don't know, work in India or something. Um, and this was all, all of this was happening while I was mostly while I was at university, like I did an undergrad degree and then I went back and did a master's. And so it was sort of like at the same time, like all of these things threaded in at the same time and I would like go back to the World Body Painting Festival on schedule every year and, and stuff. Um, but yeah, so I, with both of those things, I think it was like 2016 or something. I did, I did a reality TV show. I did a body painting reality TV show <laughs> and I didn't go very well. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure they won't care if, care if I say that now, but, um, I just, I got sort of like, you know, I was already heading in that direction, but I was just, I just got really grossed out with the medium. I was like, it's all flashy. It's just showing off. Like there's nothing real. There's no substance. It's just like tits. Um, and I felt like I was empty when I was making it. And so that like, reality show and then going back the last time to the world, world body painting festival and then, like there were there were sort of like three things one was like the last season of this show where i got super burnt out and uh hated everybody else in the cast and then one was like going back to the world body painting festival for like again and still like just get you know i real i i got i spent months working on my work i got there i competed um and then i got fourth and I spent that night crying. Like I was, I was like devastated that I had gotten fourth in the world at this thing. And I was like, maybe now's the time to quit. Like that's not really maybe what that's supposed to be for. So, um, I think that was like 2016 or something. Yeah. I just, I stopped doing, doing all of them. And, um, yeah, it took me a while to like figure out how to make art again and now I do and it, it feels like slower, less flashy, but also like way more um, resonant. Mm -hmm. Like I make stuff that like means something to me. Um, you make music primarily now, yes? Yeah, yeah, I mostly make music. Sometimes I write, sometimes I write poetry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I'm still like, I can see that I might edge back into like the realm of like costume because that costume was such a strong part of both the body painting art form and like, well, there was body painting in the circus, but like, um, I did so much costuming and I always like, um, like whatever I was envisioning, I could do like 30% of or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Now you said that you 
were like this period of life you were in undergrad and then you got a master's and then you were sort of being exposed to effective altruism. Can you kind of take me through the kind of like intellectual side of your history and, and what you were studying and, and how that all unfolded? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I theoretically have an undergraduate degree in political science and um, like Spanish and Latin American studies. In reality, I, I didn't pay much attention to it. Um, I sort of like did the bare minimum to like coast by. I didn't find it very engaging. Um, <clears throat> and I sort of didn't feel like I was like learning much, like learning how to do things. Mm. Um, and I didn't really have the sense to be like, uh, maybe do something else then. Like I was just like, yeah, yeah I'll just finish my degree and then I'll do whatever. Um, and so like now I look back at some of the stuff I learned, particularly like um, we did one undergrad um, course on power mm. and it was like different philosophies of power mm. um, and like where the legitimacy of um, of auth like, you know, if someone's got power over people, like where does the legitimacy of that power come from? Um, and that's actually been very influential for me. I didn't necessarily realize that. But there's a bunch of stuff that I, I sort of like bounced off. Like I think, I, I still think now, although I, I don't know enough about the field to really confirm it, that like international relations was sort of, um, like pre-paradigmatic in a sense. It was sort of like the like, it's like three to five different intellectual camps that didn't really communicate with each other and had entirely different epistemologies. And I didn't really understand enough about like knowledge or science to really articulate that that was what was going on. But like, I just had this sense of like, you guys don't know shit or something. Um, and so I spent a lot of my undergrad doing circus and training circus and stuff like, um, uh, but then I had this, uh, as is often the case, like I had a, a intellectual or, or existential crisis triggered by something to do with a relationship. Um, so I like, I, I had my heart broken, um, but what what really one of the things that happened was I, I let this guy like we got you know we got very close and then like I broke up with him and it like was you know I was I was sad but I was also just like really shocked that um I had let him like lead me into such gray moral territory like we didn't ever do anything bad we just talked it, it's just like the way he talked it was like everybody else in the world was like worthless or gross or something and I, it, it was like I like woke up from this like sort of hallucination being like how did I get how did I get into that like why was it that he was able that I got hooked into that and at the time I was like I think I don't have an ethical system I need an ethical system let's go get one of those um and I found this wrong and I remember that was like three months where I I'm pretty sure I did nothing but read like the internet, like read philosophy on the internet or something. Um, and I think that it was, it was really that like, like reading less wrong, reading about utilitarianism. And I would, at the time I'm not a utilitarian now, but at the time I think it was this, this promise of like, you can figure out a way to like navigate, you know, between like what you want, what the world wants from you or something like there's a principled way of doing it or something like that. Um, like here's order, here's like, it'll make sense. And also all these people are really fucking smart. Um, so I, I mean, I think I would say like, oh, and then I just went and started a master's economics as a result. But there was also an interlude where I lived in a different city and like interned as a circus director, like, and, and like did physical theater training and stuff. Um, so it was definitely a period where I was like 
try this. Does this work? I just graduated. I was like, shit, I need to like do things with my life or something. Um, but yeah, I enrolled in this, this master's in economics at the same university, but I had a very different attitude. I was like, I'm going to take this seriously. It was also more expensive. So I was like, I'm going to take this seriously. The government's not paying for all of this now. Well, not all, but like, you know, like it's going to mean a lot. And I remembered promising to myself, like, I'm not going to miss a single lecture, which I, I think I might've missed one because I was sick or something like that. But that's in like a year and a half, two years of, of like masters, um, courses. Um, and yeah, I guess for a while, I was just an effective altruist or that's what I said I was. It didn't work very well though. I was, I didn't think I got good at like helping the world and I was still pretty uh, like an annoyed at myself for not doing things or something. Um, it just felt like it, it made me turn in circles or I turned in circles in response to it. Um, so yeah. I, at some point, maybe it's like 28, 17, 18. I'm not really sure when. I sort of like loosened up the EA-ness and like learned how to make art and um, yeah. It seems um, sort of fast forwarding, like one of the things I've been really impressed by in the work that I've seen from you is, uh, and this is, this is just how I experience it, you might frame it differently, but it's something like you're really good at research and you're also really good at what might be called systems thinking. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how those aspects of your intellectual history and skills emerged. Well, I think regarding research, I'm extremely driven by what I'm driven by and extremely not driven by what I'm not driven by, which sounds dumb, but I mean like, I can't pretend to care about something and then put a bunch of work into it. And at least in terms of psychiatric crisis system I'm very like it, it moves me a lot mm -hmm. um, and I think I don't know where this came from or where this comes from but like I think I have some sort of I've, I've carried some like core belief for a long time that's like you can't solve any pr problems by like asking people to be different or like winning or something like that. Like you can't like, there's no such thing as like winning the particular conflict you have. You have to like dismantle the conflict somehow or um, like, I, I remember thinking this when I was more interested in um, like regular political systems. I was thinking like learning about democracy and stuff. And I sort of, I never had a sense of like, oh, like I might be interested in this political party or this political party. I was only interested in the designing, the design of the voting system. Like, like I was like, and you know, I don't know if I was necessarily good at predicting how change in the voting system would, would change the actual votes. But like, I, I remember just like not even being like interested for a sec in the idea of like, oh, we should just win. Like, we'll just win this competition. And <laughs> maybe one of the reasons for that is that I'm like, I'm like a very smart person, but I'm not a very, um, like, uh, how do you say, like conscientious or like, like the sort of person who like gets up and they like, they go at like eight out of 10, like every day for like a long time. Um, and so I think maybe it was just like, well, I'm not going to win whatever, you know, like if it's between me and someone who can put more hard work in, then I'm going to like 
I'm not gonna win or something like winning isn't but but then also I just had this sense of like what's the point because then they'll get upset and I'll just have to like defend the win against them or, or something like though I don't know if I'm making much sense but um you said system thinking and you said research um I guess I was very grateful for the training I had in economics around like optimization. Um, and I'm not, you know, actively working with any of this stuff at the moment. So a lot of my, any real economists like listening, you know, I'll probably make a ton of mistakes. Um, but there's a general sense of like, you can model things by breaking them down into like variables and, and um, figuring out a, a function that will like approximate those things, um, you know, and how they, they act on whatever you care about. And I was really glad to learn about this because it was really relieving after having done political science and it felt like they were just saying like, power is the answer or social constructivism is the answer. It was really nice to have like, a theory that had like pieces and stuff, but um, I think I got some sense, and I get this. I think I, I think this a lot. That's something like it's it's the system's version of like if you're so smart, why aren't you happy? Which is like if this is so good, why do we still have recessions? Or like if this is so good, like why and and actually, you know, I did really like microeconomics, which I think is like much humbler in its aims. It's like, let's see if we can predict the behavior of like a company. Macro felt like it was just, I was literally being bullshit the entire time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think there was something missing in that training that was like the idea that like, variable one can affect variable two, which can affect variable one. Mm. And that just seemed very, and I'm sure that this exists in economics now. Like I'm like, you know, for one, like com the complexity science Institute in Santa Fe is probably on this already. I'm sure they are. But in at least what I was being taught that like, it just sort of didn't exist. It's sort of one directional, like this affects this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess that, that was like one of the, the motivations for getting more interested in, in systems thinking. And I've never really had like a, a rigorous training in system science. Um, like maybe it would be cool. I'm not sure I want to do that much more study, but um, uh so it's definitely more of like a, a set of intuitions. Um, but I think like one of the main intuitions is like, I'm really interested in changing social systems. I don't know why, like, I mean, I could, I could actually hypothesize about why, but that's, that's always been like, I've always said that's what I wanted to do. That's always the thing I've like, like learned skills in order to do um if i think of the alternatives which are like affecting people like individuals or affecting like non-human systems then i get like bored i'm like no no we're doing the human human systems um <clears throat> Part of the um, reason I'm asking is like, and I realize these are like two different skill sets of around like research and systems thinking, but they're both um, intellectual capacities that I have to some degree, but I think you have to a higher degree. And so I'm kind of curious, like how I might learn them from you or how someone might learn them from you of like, what exactly does one do to do research well from your perspective? Yeah. And what does 
one do to think about systems and affect them well from your perspective? Yeah. Well, hang on. Let me ask the first que- answer the first question because these are <laughs> these are very. Um, they're both very big questions. Well, maybe mm-hmm. I'll first ask, like, what do you mean by do research well? Like, what is it about research that is good, that looks good to you, mm-hmm. makes it seem good? There's a kind of rigor that I know is possible when you're curious about something that you demonstrate. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll get to this later, but with the, with the psych project, you've been putting out these research reports about things that you've been learning about, and they... When I compare that to my own intellectual endeavors and the questions that I'm curious about and the things that I've spent time learning about, there's certain qualities that you're demonstrating there, like rigor or um, depth of consideration or things that I can't, I know I can see are there, but I don't know what they are exactly. But it's like, oh, this is, this is something I don't know how to do in the, the way that you're doing it. What's good about rigor and depth of consideration? Hmm. Like what, what do you want that those things get you? I mean, if you look at my body of writing, that's like, say publicly available, um, a lot of the blog posts that I've written, for example, not all of them, but a lot of them fall into a certain genre of like, here's a topic that I learned something about here's the story of how I learned it. And here's some things about how you might learn it too, like curated resources or like a frame on what the thing is, like presenting various models. It's very, um, like, I try to write the thing that I wish I'd had when I started learning about the thing. And Mm -hmm. because it wasn't available, I had to piece it together for Mm -hmm. myself. And so it feels like a act of service to like pass that on to someone that might be interested in it in it, um, in the future. And that's good. Like that's valuable. What I see you doing is doing a deep dive into a topic and having a suite of questions about it that are open-ended and almost digesting the information that you encounter, like not with a view towards say, like learning a specific skill or a specific piece of information, but to like have situational awareness of something very broadly so that you can interact with it more skillfully. It's almost like, I don't know, I'm, I'm often interested in a specific skill set or a specific mm-hmm. theory or a specific model, and I want to learn about that. And certainly you've done that and been able to do that, but you're, you seem to be like looking at landscapes of like, you know, mm-hmm. oh, here's how different uh, approaches to this issue have been done and like there are trade-offs and Mm. what are the trade-offs and what are the open questions and why didn't this work and there's like a historical perspective or a sociological perspective or like a political perspective or an economic perspective and you're not looking through it in any one lens and you're just it seems like you're trying to get both an awareness of what's happening and an awareness of what the levers are that you could affect the situation with and that that seems like differently scoped of terms of what you're looking at and how you look at it and what you can do with that kind of information than like, oh, I don't know, I got really interested in this model or this skill set or um, this teacher or whatever. It's like um, almost like a higher, higher level, broader approach to things. And I see a lot of things like nuance in the way you talk about it and an awareness of trade-offs and like a huge list of open, broad questions and Um, you know, looking at something from many different angles, you know, um, I've been sort of curious to see what practical approach you'll take because, uh, yeah, yeah. Like there's so many different angles that you've come at and like the things that you've said to me privately or that you've said publicly, like, oh, maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try this Mm. are like so radically different that I'm like, it's hard for me to know which way you go. And I, I, you know, I'm still in sort of discovery phase of this project, but um, yeah, I I think that that evinces a broader scope of thinking than I'm currently able to do myself. That's the first time I've ever heard anyone use the word evinces Uh, in like real life. That's really cool. Sorry. I guess like the thing you're describing to me sounds like a difference in desire. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And maybe that's matched with like, or like maybe given that there's a difference in like uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like the primary difference you're describing to me is like, you're like, I, I want to learn a skill for some reason, which isn't really clear. And now that I've learned it, I want other people to have that skill. So it's like a teaching, mm -hmm. like motivation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, as you were describing that, I was thinking about the research I've been doing. It feels like spelunking or like um, scrabbling in mud or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like trying to find like handholds. Mm -hmm. And... I guess one of the things that I, th I think I try to do, which I think some people who have like change making projects or whatever that I know of, I don't think do as much mm -hmm. is I try to operate on the assumption that I'm no more capable than any of the people who've tried before. Mm. Like there's nothing special about me and my position in the world that means that I can magically succeed at something where other people haven't. So if people haven't succeeded at something, then it was probably really hard. And there's a real reason for it that I need to take into account. Mm -hmm. um, like, and, and I think that that's like, it feels, it feels like, uh, you know, I, a development like a particular practice of a character trait or something um i should take my own advice for a lot of things at the moment currently but um yeah like i think that there's definitely a i want to call it like tech culture thing of like everybody else who did it before is shit and we're the special ones and i think particularly from maybe it was from this relationship that that really brought me to like it's dissolution or, or I'd like to say it's dissolution, but it's dissolution one time brought me to EA um, that I was just really skeptical of any plan or any like worldview that hinges on being very, very different from other people. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, because I guess I think that that's more often an emotional feeling rather than a pragmatic fact about the world. Um, it has been for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can think of the people, the people that I know who believe that they are uniquely different or, or, or people who believe like the world is super fucked up and like we've got to do something about it or whatever. There's often a sense of like deep alienation. And that's like a core relational thing. That's not about their political beliefs. Like the political beliefs flow out of that. Or, or the structure or whatever. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I think there's part of me, there's, there's definitely a part of me that like judges everybody from all sides all of the time. Mm -hmm. And like is doing you know, the same way I was like, well, like that, that guy directed that circus show really badly, I can do better. Like, you know, sometimes when I look at um, idealistic projects, I see that they like, haven't done their homework and they're not connected to the history of of attempts to change that problem like mm. and and so i'm like well i'm gonna do this better than you mm -hmm. like i don't know if that's it's probably some of the motivation is there is, is is like a sense that like obviously you want to look at, at what people have done in the past um but it's yeah, I guess I would describe it as like a pushback against exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like, which is also somewhat relaxing. It's like great to know that like we're not the only ones who can save the world. Like that's pretty cool. Like <laughs> other people have also previously saved the world. You can do it in increments. <laughs> like it's not this like either or thing. Um, mm -hmm. And also like the world would be okay if you don't save it. Like it's, chugging along it's doing mm. its stuff you know um like that all feels like it's it's relevant part of the attitude for this this sort of research at least um that i've been seeing um i think that some of maybe the thing that you're you're looking at comes from 
I'm not a crafts person. Like some people, um, I have an ex I, you know, care about deeply and he, he's a stuntman. It's his thing. <laughs> and he is extremely good at, um, setting himself on fire. Like, <laughs> literally like world-class at that, like one of the best in Australia, possibly like the only, you know, the best in Australia at a particular type of thing. <laughs> and he will dedicate like a lot of time to developing like a new martial art or a new sword thing or whatever. And like, he gets a lot of joy and like sense of self out of developing these new skills and having them. And I just don't, it's not, I mean, it's nice. It's nice when you're good at something and people think you're cool or you, or you, or you have fluency in it. And then you can use that as like a palette of, of colors to, to express something or to, to, to understand something. But like, I'm really like much more hacky than that. I'm like, okay, but I want to do this or, or like, I want this. So what's the like, the thing I need to, mm -hmm. to do that. And often that's like, how can I hack together like minimum viable skills? Um, and the thing that I, I also would like to, to get better at, or that, that is like a next step in my growth is, um, getting much better at like figuring out who the right person is to like get involved, to get their skills, mm. you know, rather than needing to develop them myself. But yeah, it's like, I'm much, I'm generally much more committed to like what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. than I am to like the craft. I would say like, there are some exceptions. Like I do feel committed to singing now in a way that, you know, if someone was like, cool, you have to stop singing and now you have to play the harmonic. I'd be like, hang on. No, 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 no. Don't take that away from me. But most other stuff, it's just like, I'll learn it if I need it for something. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think that, that that's true in research as well. Like, you know, um, th there's something really satisfying about being willing to learn any of the relevant things. Like I've learned so many inane facts about the international classification of diseases, mm. like database or like the legislation that governs like Medicaid billing in California mm. or whatever, like, um, Maybe I think of that as, again, like something that I can do more uniquely or, or with like a perspective I can bring is I do think that a lot of people do identify with like the role that they have or the, the, the practice they do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a researcher or something. I'm not a researcher. I just do research because mm -hmm. that's what I need to do right now. Um, identify much more with like the archetype of like an entrepreneur or something rather than mm -hmm. a, than a researcher. Um, and then some of the actual skills are just like, did a lot of econometrics. And when mm -hmm. you've done enough like stats, you can sort of wing reading most medical, like the, the statistics in most medical papers is less complicated than the statistics in a lot of uh, like economics papers. Not that it's worse, it's just simpler, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. Like, that's just like a thing that I've learned to learn to do. And yeah, I guess like harness like voraciousness mm -hmm. in the service of learning some stuff, mm -hmm. learning the right stuff. I'm trying to think how to ask this question, like, you know, uh, I hear you that like research for you isn't like a core to who you are. It's just something you've needed to do to mm. succeed at the things you want to do. And yeah, you know, you're quite good at it. You're, you know, I, there's things for me to learn from mm. you about it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to put the frame of our respective current writings next to each other of like, yeah, I'm interested in learning this skill from you. And I sense that like, if I was able to research at a higher level at the level that you are that like good things would open up that I can't be aware of right now. And just, mm. you know, I, I just practice trusting my intuition generally. And so, mm. um, I wonder, uh, I, yeah. I wonder if one of the differences aside from like, I don't, 
actually know what your academic training is, but I assume that you're smart enough to pick up most of the relevant academic things if you wanted to, or mm -hmm. if you if you do want to. But I wonder if some of it has to do with like disagreeableness. Mm. Like there's a sense in which like when I I'm like researching stuff, you know. I'm sort of like pushing it all the time or like mm. being like, nah, nah, it's not like, like, or like looking for like a, ha you know, I'm like a, like a thief or something like, like tying all the doors mm. and there's like a pushiness and there's a like asshole quality to that. Mm. And there's a like, well, why haven't you fixed this problem yet? If you're so good at this thing that you <laughs> say, and you know, I think of you as a very <laughs> kind, encouraging person. And maybe that's like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't know if you would want to develop that. You mm. know, that's. Mm. I I don't know how much that is true, but it, there's definitely a sense in which, like, like I think of a conference I went to recently, and I was sort of like scouting people that I might want to talk to, and like, I remember I had a couple of different conversations. One of them was with a director <clears throat> of a small advocacy nonprofit, and I really wanted to know about her how she related to like funding and stuff. And then there was one with a guy who like worked at a licensing organization. So they did like licensing for mostly um, uh, like addiction stuff. And in both cases, I like, you know, I was like pretty like, so tell me this, tell me this, tell me this, you know, like, what about this? What about this? What about this? Um, and mm. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I know that I've had that quality for a long time. Like I have an early memory of my dad basically running out of answers to the questions that I was asking him and being like, I need to just tell you, I don't know. Like I'm, I've run out. I'm sorry. No more answers. I'm yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's like a flip side. That's like a positive thing about like pushiness. Mm, 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 that's interesting. Say, say I got interested, I or someone listening to this got interested mm. in some topic that's like, ah, it would be good to do research on this mm. topic. How would you recommend that someone go about that? Or where do you start yourself when you are opening? A well, new... I want to know what they want to do. Uh -huh. Why uh -huh. do they want the research? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's a thing that I'm definitely not good at, which is like, um, the world has a collective epistemological practice we call science and the way that it's made is like one little brick at a time and people make small contributions and then other people vet them and stuff. And I, I'm not like, I'm not that sort of person. Like I can't, can't be like a legit, like academic researcher in an institution or something. Um, because I, like, for one thing, I think I'm like using mixed, epistemological strategies like sometimes I'm like well I'm gonna go like on th my read of the people here or I'm gonna go on like just like the the sort of stats evidence or I'm not really gonna pay attention to the stats evidence because I have this hunch about like I don't know it's like this sort of like lots of ways of <clears throat> figuring out if knowledge is legitimate um but so if that, if it's that direction, I, I have no clue. There are many researchers in the world and they're probably pretty, the, the, the direction where you're like making a little bit contribution to science. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I suspect it's, it's, it's hard for me to be more specific than this, oh. but I suspect for myself that if I was doing the kind of research that I see you doing, it would be with a view towards some specific project that I was hoping to Mm. be more informed about how to approach it skillfully. Yeah, I mean... It wouldn't be like, oh, there's one specific question. I might have a suite of specific questions, but it wouldn't be like, oh, there's just this one thing that I want to know or get to the bottom of. It would be like very um, situational of, I want to learn more about this aspect of reality or society so that I can change it or affect it. Mm. Yeah. Um... I mean, another way to answer this question is just also, where do you start when you start on your own research projects? Like, uh, what do you do when you start something like this? 
Well, I, can, I guess I can describe the way that I approached the way that I approached this this project, which was mm -hmm. in a rage. <laughs> it's a great way to start research. I mean, for, for context, I, my for for people listening, because Tasha knows this. Um, after several months of intense mental health crises and um, attempted mental health treatment, my brother took his life last year. Um, close to, we're, we're we're coming up to about a year ago, um, and. I went back to Australia. I had to spend two weeks in quarantine um, by myself, which was, uh, you know, not the best place to be when you're uh, acutely grieving. Um, but one of the things that I did that time and then also when I was in lockdown, because Australia went into lockdown basically that day, um, the day that he died, um, was I... Um, started I was like with my plan I'm like well I've got to fix this I've got to like I'm you know you know it felt it felt very much like a like a revenge impulse you know um mm -hmm. and I guess I started out with my with this idea of like well this is what would have helped you know like this is like I had this idea, you know, if there'd just been like a center that was sort of like this and people treated him like this, it would have been different. And I started being like, well, do these exist? So I looked it up and I, um, <clears throat> I, I tried to find something that was the closest to what I imagined. And I didn't quite find it. I found a lot of other different things. And then... Like, I, you know, I made a list of these. I started reaching out to some of the people who'd created them. Um, I ended up, uh, maybe like a month or two later, um, doing like a birthday fundraiser for myself for one of the charities that was sort of in this direction. Um, but with each one that looked promising that I found, I, and the ones that, you know, so I found some that were historical, like that had, had opened and then had closed. So I was basically just asking like, why did this either fail and close down or why did it not get bigger? Like what is stopping this from taking over and being the new default? Um, and that was sort of, basically, you know, it was something like, find alternative, like look for alternatives. And that was just like, a, you know, a bunch of Googling and stuff and, and reading. And then when I found them, I just asked, asked like what's stopping this from being, um, from being the answer already? Like what, why is this not already the case? And then often the fastest way to do that, particularly in more alternative projects, because people were really welcoming was to just ask them, you know, um, and then part of it was like using my intuition about what was a real project and what was sort of just like a facade. Um, you know, a lot of things, particularly if they're funded by the government, you know, they're sort of coded in like bureaucraties and just one second, uh, I think my internet's breaking up again. Oh, there we go. You're back. Uh, what were you saying? Uh, the last word I heard was bureaucraties. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of bureaucraties in um, in a lot of projects, particularly ones funded by the government. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a term I wanted to say that is used in cult analysis called cathexis, hmm. which is where a word within a particular cultural context gets like it's it's implicit meaning gets expanded far above um what it sort of is meant to actually mean and it often has like a moral component mm. and you can sort of see a lot of the jargon in um government stuff like like you know if you read policy documents or whatever um you can tell the words that are cathected mm. you know so like um in crypto this might be like decentralized 
Mm. Um, in in mental health, um, like one of the words is uh, in the community. They love the phrase in the community. Um, <laughs> the other is lived experience. If someone mm. has lived experience. Um, and then the, even the word treatment, the word treatment, and it's sort of euphemistic because they never actually describe what is happening. You know, they're described, they're using the word care, the word treatment. Anyways, so we sort of try and get a handle on what things seemed more pragmatic, direct um, than others. Um, and then I just, yeah, I essentially was following a rabbit hole of like questions. Some of them were at people, like I interviewed a bunch of people and some of them were Googling and um, not a lot of quantitative stuff. Like I've mostly been like, what is the fact? Like, what is this rule? What is the, you know, um, and yeah, essentially like a lot of what I've been asking myself is, okay, so if this is so cool, why isn't it the answer already? Mm. You know, mm. and like, if this was so cool 50 years ago, why wasn't it the answer back then? Like why, you know, if they was, you know, so optimistic back then, then like, why do we still have problems now? Mm. Um, and that's pretty much it. So like, it's a combination of like finding the blocks, like finding the things that make people stuck or make the project stuck. And then also like finding the lights, like where is the energy? Like what are people doing? What, I mean, it's still pretty hard to find, but it's like what, are what things are working or like what places have something that's working mm. um and you know and some of that comes down to my values as well like it's very hard you know i i put a pretty high um priority on negotiation and integration and like de-escalating conflict mm. and so it would be pretty hard for me to be convinced that a you know crisis response project that involved um you know involuntary treatment or like a, a high emphasis on that on on involuntary commitment which is like treating people against their will would um <clears throat> you know would be good um so some of this is like it's almost like aesthetic or, or moral tastes mm. um you know, and, and trying to figure out the extent to which that's like a sensible way to navigate is, is part of the project. Um, Can I reflect what I'm hearing from you overall and yeah. see if it sounds accurate? Uh -huh. um, so what I'm hearing is like, for starters, you have a sense of why you're interested, like why you care and what you're looking to do. It's like a motivated thing for you to research. You care about it. And there's like something you're hoping to do practically. It's not just like a theoretical thing or like an experiment you're not looking to find just like one piece of data you mm -hmm. you you have a direction that you're going in and a reason that you care and it seems like you uh also have a suite of like specific questions that you're interested in that you add to or change or update as you go along and you do that by uh and like investigate those questions and answer them by a combination of like searching for things, reading things that you find, talking to people, maybe writing about what you find and you iterate on that as you ask your questions and are like moving in the direction of like um, updating your models of what's happening, why things went the way they went in the past, what succeeded, what failed and mm -hmm. how you might be able to use that information from your vantage point with your, the project that you're doing. Yeah, roughly. And I think one of the things I was thinking when you were mentioning the having a want mm -hmm. or having a desire is, uh, I think for me, embodiment is a very important part of this. Mm. Um, like I can sort of locate, you know, at different times, the parts of my body that feel like they're driving 
mm. motivation. Like it's not, it's not like just my attention. It's like my whole, like I can, I can sort of like check in to my body and see, you know, what direction it is wanting to, like, I can't, I can't sort of like top down, give myself a desire, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm like discovering the desire that exists in my body already. Mm, that's hopeful. That's yeah. hopeful. It's so amazing to like, I'm just like separately, this total tangent, but like, I'm grateful to be connected to people that have these skills and like, like a, a huge variety of skills with the people I talk to on the podcast, or I'm just connected to generally. And also, you know, like the phenomenological spiritual skill set of like psychological, you know, whatever, they have some kind of background where they can say something like you did. And it's not just, um, you know, I wouldn't actually be surprised if people that are really good at what they do generally have these kinds of skills, even if they're not yeah, framing it that true. way or talking about it. But it's nice that you can be like, oh yeah, it's like from my body and it's not top down. And, you know, I can feel into that and be steered I, by that. As is an entirely side note, I think that mo that most people who make it to the top of a competitive field and then stay there for a long time have like, I'd at least say like a mostly unified drive. Like their body is like on board with what they're doing and is like driving it. Like, I don't think, I think it's probably possible to like win once or twice or something, but like to consistently stay producing something. Like I think of like Madonna, mm -hmm. like Madonna unified towards whatever her like direction is, you know? Uh -huh. Like, cause you can't otherwise, like you, you cannot be that level of productive while like fighting yourself. So there's a few directions I really want to go from from here, and I'm a little bit torn about them. But you know, we're going to get to your psych project still. But I want to come at it with a little bit more depth. And you know, maybe just to start, the thing that you just said about being able to feel your body and let that motivate the research, like to me, that demonstrates what I know about you. That you know, you've done a fair bit of spiritual practice and psych work and like transformative practices and that kind of thing. And I'd be curious to kind of just get an overview of what your history with those things has been. Yeah. I struggled to give a history because it feels like every time I give a, like a spiritual history, it somehow like bites me in the ass. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like it's set up just so that whatever thing I described myself as having accomplished will then be the next thing that I can't do <laughs> or something. Um, which is to say, uh, I, I spiritually identify as someone who doesn't know what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, <laughs> that's important to me. It's an important, um, label. Um, but I mean, one of the ways to start describing this is to re point back at what I was describing driving me earlier. I was saying like, you know, I did body painting because I wanted people to think I was special or, I mean, not only, but like that was a big motivator or I um, found EA because I was worried about having like my belief system hijacked or something. Um, there's a way in which I guess any of the spiritual experiences I've had have been both out of a desire for the things that I've seen described, like, you know, I've read a book and they've said, this is the experience I'm going to have. <clears throat> but also out of like, fuck, this hurts, Look at, make it stop. Um, and so I technically EA was a gateway drug because I got interested in David Chapman's work through finding it on less wrong and David Chapman his background is as, as an artificial intelligence researcher and he's sort of like spiritually a programmer. That's his energy. But then also uh, he's a Vajrayana Buddhist and um, a lot of his writing was very interesting to me and not just 
um, his, but also other tantric writing. Um, I several years ago went on a deep dive for about three months reading a book called Tantra Illuminated by Christopher Wallace. Um, and I think what it did was it described a kind of perception of the world, relationship to the world, attitude towards the world that seemed, whatever it was, I wanted it. Um, and <laughs> I'm not very good at describing spiritual thing phenomena in general. Um, but I will say that the, the branches that I've been most interested in have been particularly focused on the richness of the world and the sense that you're not, there's no place to escape to. There's nothing to escape to. And there's also no like big daddy who is going to decide things. Like there's a sort of sense of precisely this, what you have here and nothing else. Like, like not, you know, you don't get any like tapping out or something, um, which, I guess I saw a lot of like renunciate traditions. There's more like having the, the tapping out attitude. Um, but I, yeah, I got really interested in meditation and had a pretty profound experience of not having a self, of, of no self um, while at a festival doing some exciting things. Um, and that I think was I don't know I, I guess like it, it was it was a one-way portal like it, you know I feel like I, I went through a door I'm now a different person on the other side of it I can't like go back through that door I mean I can sometimes forget you know and like um play this game as if I'm a person who doesn't who hasn't had that experience but it, you know, then I dust the dust off and I'm that person again. Um, but yeah, so I was like reading a bunch of Tantra books and um, I'd also done like, a, you know, like CFAR and effective altruism and stuff. I'd, I'd done like focusing, um, which is a practice where you bring attention, you find a memory and then you bring attention to the sensations in your body associated with that memory. And I remember the first time I did it, I did it with the teacher there and I like discovered what shame felt like for the first time. And it was, it was interesting because it was obvious that it had always, it was always there in my body, you know, cause the memory that I was thinking about was not that long ago. It, like it was a few hours before the actual session. Um, but it sort of came into my awareness and then it like couldn't un like it couldn't come out of my awareness, if that makes sense. Um, and so I guess the two streams of, you call them traditions or, or, or cultures or something that have influenced my practice the most have been this general Vajrayana Buddhist sphere. And then also the group um, of, I call like, DIY uh, sober psychonauts, where maybe like who've been involved in, in CIFAR and also leverage um, leverage research. I definitely I never was there, but I um, learned some of their um, self inquiry uh, skills from people who were there, and they became very important ways of like um, understanding myself. Um, and then around 29, well, at the beginning of 2019, I <clears throat> was in a retreat with a meditation teacher called Dan Brown, who actually passed away this week um, after many years of um, a battle of Parkinson's, with Parkinson's. Um, and I had a really unusual experience after 
an attachment meditation. We just did this thing where you imagine your ideal parent. And um, it was a few days in. And I immediately got like a fever and chills mm. and like had to go lie down for like a day and a half. <clears throat> and uh, from then on, like for several months, I had quite a lot of like joyous energy. Like if I, if I sort of paid attention to the back of my spine, the back of my neck, I would feel this like energy rushing up it. Um, and I had a lot of chaotic relational stuff going on at the time um, uh, my, with my long distance partner and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I had like that sort of dovetailed with a, like a, a very explosive romantic relationship that sort of had the effect of, of um, amplifying what I was understanding at the time to, being, to be a Kundalini awakening which is um, sort of like uh, if, if the energy in your body, like not fancy, just like the energy used for running and like being excited and stuff, if that like had a thunderstorm that went up your spine for like several months. Um, and that was um, probably one of the key parts of my spiritual experience. Um, the, the relational aspects were very challenging and there was a lot of pain and people got very hurt. Um, but the spiritual aspects were also very important. It was like sort of being on like a bucking bull or something or a roller coaster and just like allowing whatever was gonna happen to me happen to me um, through this somatic experience. Um, it, so it was like psychosomatic, so it was n not only changing the way my body was, but also changing um, what I believed about the world, the, a bunch of patterns around how I was behaving with people and things like that. Um, so that um, was sort of the focus of my practice, like just essentially the feeling of like, I have to just hang on and allow this to happen and and you know for me it was very important to, to have the sense of like that i was dying to it mm. um that i was allowing whatever was going to happen to move fully through me and and um that i was sort of like yeah dying or being reborn in the process um that was pretty important um and yeah that sort of since you know, the last couple of years, a lot of the work I had then done was was somatic, um, bringing my attention to different parts of my body and noticing where energy is um, getting stuck or um, where there's particular tensions and things like that. Um, and now, you know, even in the last like few weeks, I'm noticing like yeah, we have a pretty normal body nowadays. It's going to have to do all the more normal stuff. Like, you know, you got to do, you got to regularly give it yogic practice, right? It's not going to do it for you. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like acutely normal now. Um, but... I think that a thing that I, I notice that's different is it's very easy for me to understand what I want, what I think, what I feel, um, what I value, rough, roughly, it's, it's not perfect, and to pick that up in other people. Um, and, you know, for the most part, although like, I'm not going to be too boastful about it because this historically always falls apart whenever I talk about it. Um, you know, it, it means I feel much more like a whole, a whole person, like um, one person, one team, you know, that may have different parts um, that are all working together um, rather than 
you know, very disparate parts of me or like, or, or being confused about why my body was doing a certain thing. Like it, it generally makes sense now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I still have a lot of, you know, it's not like some of my fundamental character traits have changed. Um, but I don't know, they, they don't feel, it doesn't feel like there are any, you know, basement children. I mean, maybe there are basement children that I don't know of, but it feels like definitely a lot of the basement children have come up and they've like had a shower and like been fed and they get to hang out and also steer the ship. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. <laughs> it feels very, any time I describe a spiritual process like that, it makes it sound like done or obvious or like final or that that's the way to describe it. Like, you know, I think that being certain about what exactly has happened to me and what I might be now is like, anytime I think I know what I'm doing, the universe finds a way to like, make it clear that I'm not the boss. (laughs) So yeah, totally. I try to be more, yeah, um, humble about that mm-hmm. than I probably was just now. Mm-hmm. Oh, it came across as reasonably humble to me, at least. Uh, I yes, think... I get the humble points. <laughs> <laughs> Accumulate enough of those, then I'll be the best. <laughs> um, it makes me want to ask, like, uh you know i told you this recently but i've been finding it useful to sort of playfully lightly categorize people as meta people or karuna people you know loving kindness people or or compassion people and i of course am a loving kindness person and i've categorized you as a mm-hmm. karuna person in my mind you know not not like oh this is the permanent only <clears throat> box mm-hmm. like that's all you are or something but um you know fit easily into that category from that view and Yeah, it makes me want to ask, um, I know that both with your brother's passing and, you know, other things that you've been through that you've alluded to, like you've dealt with, I think, a lot of grief and Mm. uh, change and suffering. And, you know, that's everyone's lot, of course, Mm -hmm. everyone has to go through that. But, you know, you've gone through that pretty young and multiple times and to Mm -hmm. a great degree. And, and also with a, with a practice, you know, Mm, with the perspective of practice. And so I'm curious to ask like how you grieved, you know, your Mm. brother and other things in your life, like how you learned to grieve. So that, I mean, the thing you're alluding to is this, this, that relationship with this one particular lover that was very transformative and very, um, there was a huge sense of, of mystery as to how it might unfold. Mm-hmm. And, and when it was clear that I was losing this relationship, how I might endure that, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, and I think that, I mean, that was, <laughs> it was like three months worth of relationship and six months worth of grieving. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I say grieving, I mean like, every like crying every single day like like just very physiologically intense like experience and 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 i think a lot of reasons for that and one of them was spiritual like it was a very very profound gonna use this word even though i don't agree with necessarily but like spiritual ecstasy Mm -hmm. or something um and I think that like I had some belief which like served me and didn't serve me. I don't know if this is like, I've got a more nuanced view on it now, but I think it was a good starting point that I needed to allow what was happening to happen. I needed to surrender to it. Um, And if there was pain, I needed to feel it. If there was anger, I needed to feel it. And that, I think like, your question was like, how do you relate to that that grieving? How did you you grieve or learn to grieve through these experiences? 
in that situation, it was very confusing because it was not just grieving. It was like grieving and also intense spiritual transformation and also like the death of a lot of parts of me that were no longer needed all at the same time. And then like the actual ongoing relationship with the person, you know, like there were a lot of things happening at the same time. Um, and so the, the grieving wasn't separate from becoming the person who had been changed by that experience. It was like, um, I, I think, um, trying to describe exactly what I was or like sort of what I was doing. Um, I think there's, there's a sense you get, like if you know, you're going around your day about your day and then something happens and it becomes like unbearable and you know, our normal sane response is to like turn away, do something else, like go, go somewhere else. that isn't unbearable. And I think that the core thing I was doing and, and most of this was, um, you know, I was reading a lot of Pema Chodron books and Chogyam Trumpa books, and they were both like really strong guides in this, um, was like to notice a thing that's uncomfortable and then to just like breathe a little bit more into it and breathe mm -hmm. a little bit more into it. And um, one of the things that came out of this was I made a lot of art. Um, you know, I wrote a staggering amount of poetry and music. Um, and and like things that were very archetypal as well like um you know uh very symbolic communication very symbolic art um and the I, I think part of that was the person the other person was an artist and i think that i sort of like had a direct transmission of a particular way of um experiencing art that um uses art as a spiritual practice um so uses making art as sort of a way of committing to not flinching away from reality um mm -hmm. and that like i sort of like learned it all at once it's like it's like like learning how to surf at the top of the wave mm. you know you're like well i sure hope i learn how to do this before <laughs> this wave dumps me <laughs> um and, um, you know, and I was very lucky that like, I wasn't in a like financially squeezed place at that time. Like I had enough space, I had enough social surroundings to, to be safe in letting myself like go through whatever was happening. Um, and to really like give it attention and patience. Um, and there's something I mean, this happened as well when, when I lost my brother, but I think the first one was definitely more surprising, confusing, intense. I had no idea what was going on. Um, there's a kind of like confidence, like pretty deep confidence that at least I've gotten. And I think you, you can see it sometimes in people when they've had something like this, that is that you know how to die to reality when reality demands it. Hmm. Like you know how to do it. Um, like you've wrestled with yourself before to like look reality straight in the eye. Um, and, and I think it's like, I think if this is like a necessary skill for people who live in tragedies, like if you imagine your life is like a, a romance or a tragedy or a, like a hero's journey or whatever, we don't really have as much like advice for like the, the tragic heroes. Um, but I, I think that for me, and there's a physiological stance as well. Like I, um, I wrote a line in a song once that was like, um, it moves through me like a flood. And it's a sense of being totally like translucent or, or transparent or um, permeable and allowing whatever the thing was, whether it was like pain or the horror that something had unbearable had happened, like letting that in all the way through <laughs> me. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of this was definitely like helped from, by teachings from like 
tantric practitioners because I think that, you know, they use emotions as the the vehicle to getting, you know, fucking enlightened or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, so sort of the same way that, you know, if you're, if you're doing sitting meditation, you're allowed, like maybe that's something like the Vipassana, you're allowing whatever arises to arise. It's that done at the moment that the emotional impact of something in the world hits you. Mm. Um, and yeah, I would say that's like one of my main, one of the practices I'm, I'm particularly loyal to, even though I don't really know how to describe it or like what it is exactly. Mm. Um, and so it was sort of just like that over and over and over again. Um, there was only like once where I remember thinking like, this is endless, like I'll never get out of this. Um, but like, yeah. Um, it's, I guess it's sort of like, it involves a kind of faith. Like, I mean, the faith could be like, I'll be okay, but it's, it's not even that straightforward. It's like just an orientation of willingness towards the future as, a, as opposed to an orientation of like recoiling. Hmm. Um, and yeah, like I, um, I like to think that that's given me like a lot of reps in mm -hmm. that direction. Um, and I, I try to do that in, in everything mm -hmm. um, this week, moderate, but like, <laughs> um, yeah. It seems to me like that process of going through tragedy and really grieving it and really processing that and being transformed by it is part of what makes it possible for you to feel and act on compassion as far as I can tell from the outside like and I think I think you know if I'm just speaking about myself like that's probably part of what makes compassion harder for me is that I've been relatively lucky so far to not have too many of these kinds of tragedies or, um, you know, there was a period of my life where like all four of, I guess, yeah, all four of my grandparents, like living grandparents um, died in successive years. It was like one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four years in a row. Um, mm -hmm. And, but it was like, they were like, I loved them very mm -hmm. much and they were my grandparents and it was like, mm -hmm. you know, that are elderly yeah. and expected and, um, <clears throat> that feels subjectively pretty different than like a breakup or, um, you know, your, your brother dying and, you know, him being quite yeah. young and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I just wanted to add something about that, mm -hmm. which is like, I have quite a lot of faith in like allowing crying to happen. Um, because I think that I, I don't, I have no like evidence to back this up except my own intuitions over time. But I, I have this sense that cry, the release of crying is a really important part of yielding to what's true or like accepting what's true. Um, that like, if, if you think about your, <clears throat> your expectations of the world being like held in your body and in your stance, the way that you physically orient as a, as an animal that like, it's like crying is this, like, like this washing out that like subtly can help you reorient. Um, so like when I think of something moving through me, I'm often like literally, you know, it's as if there's like an internal power wash or something. Um, <laughs> That, or an internal, like, you've got a hose and you're, like, street cleaning. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the in terms of grief helping with compassion, I... That's, I mean, one of the, the teachers that I have been mostly reading, but um, uh, incredibly grateful for is Pema Chodron, and I think that she has a great gift for teaching all of... Basically teaching very simply, um, and she teaches... And, and the things that I have learned from her 
have been or, or what I've gotten from her is what I feel like is, is like a warm encouragement to let, let my heart break open mm. um, and to let heartbreak which I really think of as as the world not conforming to what you want, mm. you know, like you want something and you sort of expect it's going to be that way and then it isn't. And then the accepting is, is the heartbreak. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, she describes heartbreak as sort of this, this vehicle to being touched by other people mm. um, or, or by what's going on with other people. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely been true for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me that like, and part of the reason I ask is like just been going through various forms of grieving recently. And mm. uh, <clears throat> it seems to me like one of the internal obstacles to allowing things, to letting your heart being broken, to actually grieving is like, I notice repeatedly a belief coming up of like this isn't happening or this shouldn't be happening to me or like this is yeah. not the way it's supposed to go down or yeah. something like that this is indignation mm. yeah yeah there's a thing again for some reason this feels like a greek tragedy thing i, mm. I don't know why you know there's a thing that i think of as like maybe you call it wisdom but it's really like a like a, a lack of naivety like I associate it with with people who've gone on long voyages or something that's like a recognition of exactly how badly the world can fuck you over mm. and a willingness to still be in it mm. just like around that with that mm -hmm. you know and that to me is like the, the essence of this like allowing your heart to be broken open thing because um you know, you, you sort of have, I, this is a four by four in my head. I'm not exactly sure how to describe two by two, but, um, there's a sense of like, you can know that the world is dangerous and then retreat inside your little cocoon of safety. Hmm. And that cocoon of safety can be quite big, particularly if you have a lot of privilege, you know, that could be lots of people that can be like, you do plenty of things you can spend your entire life in there. Um, but you will still be as terrified when you come to the things that are truly out of your control. Um, if you don't have practice being in the situation where you're out of your control, which is, again, it feels like it's like there's a surfing metaphor here or something like, um, it's a different skill to control the world than it is to control yourself or, or to relate to yourself in the world that's uncontrollable. Mm. Um, and, I think that I would even go so far as to describe it as like committing to being heartbroken because mm. there's endless, you know, I mean, I live in San Francisco. I can go get heartbroken by walking down the street. You mm. know, in fact, I do that. that that's, that's a thing. Um, <clears throat> like y you can, yeah, like you can have endless opportunities to, to let your heart really break by connecting into someone else's experience. Mm. Um, or, or even just to your own, you know, mm -hmm. kind of those two things. Um, but I don't know, I, I feel very loyal to that attitude. Mm. I feel like this is my stance. Can, I, I think I'm getting a sense of it, but can you say what the motivation is to say something like commit to being heartbroken? Like what, what's the, or commit to allowing heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Um, what the motivation for that like why, why would you say something like that like i can guess but i want to hear how you would describe it so i think this is maybe a quite personal ex a personal explanation mm -hmm. but i think one of the reasons i value spiritual practice in particular dredging stuff up and bringing it into your sense of self so highly is i think that you know, in my, my family history and my like ancestry, there's been a lot of um, damage done by shoving things down. 
And in particular, I think I just inherited the sort of psyche that has a lot of the things that you shove down in it. Mm. Like, you know, um, I, I've talked to you about this, but like, there's a part of, of me that I would call the, the monster that's very outrageous, like it's extremely dangerous in terms of like how it can push people and what it wants from people and how it might relate to them and stuff like that. And I guess what I've seen in other people, and I think this was true with, with my brother Jeff and, and to a lesser extent other people who inherited my a psyche shaped like mine, some of whom are in my family and some of whom aren't, um, that they got like fragmented and uh, maybe hidden or stale or powerless or something like there was a way that they weren't able to be as full or as as um maybe powerful um or alive um a lot of different things like resilient like just in general healthy or something um and and part of it was this like got to shove it down, don't talk about it, um, which is an exaggeration. But, um, you know, I, I think of myself as extremely lucky to have encountered the spiritual cultures I have and to have spiritual friends like, you know, you and other people that have agreed to me, this is this is a good plan. You know, mm -hmm. we can do this um, because I, to me, it feels like a matter of survival. Like if I don't, well, like I, I the, my family trees like sort of littered with the, the trail of destruction in some ways. Not not mm. all of the family tree, but um, and also not just my family tree, but like history. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's one reason. I think the other is like it's sort of circular, but there is a, a, a sort of faith mm. you develop. Like I have trust, or, or like hope or something that the way that I will best be in the world by my own definition and by the definition of like, hopefully at least some people around me is by accepting it, by seeing it very clearly and it including me. And I think that, um, Heartbreak's just a description of the steps in some ways to getting to that seeing clearly um, and, and, and like being able to respond to the world. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate you being so real and vulnerable about this because it's uh, something that you've really learned from tragedy or difficult experience and it's uh, something that's of benefit to me in my own life right now and uh yeah. certainly everyone has to go through this so i appreciate you sharing your wisdom about I, it i think also like i mean i i want to sell the benefits to anyone who hasn't had this sort of experience like mm -hmm. tragedy is bad conventionally right mm -hmm. but like you know the sort of groundedness you get from knowing that you can go through a tragedy mm -hmm. like it's a kind of if, insurance or something mm -hmm. i mean that's not even the right word but it's there's so much space for joy you know you're not like you know because you're you're thinking like what's the worst that's going to happen it's like all oh, that yep okay we can do that mm -hmm. like yeah there are still many things i'm afraid of like tons and tons of things um but i can feel that developing or it has over over time developed mm -hmm. yeah the word that keeps coming to mind as you describe this is like courage or bravery like that there's yeah. a, a confidence or courage that comes with this yeah does that resonate I, yeah i read someone said something recently that was like courage is like the meta virtue it's a multiplier on all of the other virtues mm. because courage is the virtue that allows you to live out the other virtues when things get difficult mm -hmm. like if you're compassionate but you're only compassionate when you're not afraid then like really that limits the scope of your compassion you know mm -hmm. it's um and yeah that's yeah, courage, <laughs> developing courage is developing courage and developing persistence, I think, are two of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about and focusing on at the moment. Yeah, I appreciate that you're having a frame of like 
trying to cultivate specific virtues in your life. I think that that's uh, yeah. commendable. So thank you for that. I think you've probably been pretty influential in that regard. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. How did that come across? What do you mean? How did my friendship and example influence you in that way? Well, I mean, I guess it's pretty much all almost, it's almost all been described, but I, I, the, the example I'll give is just, um, you know, I think that there was a while and it, it has been true times that I've been like seeking extremes or, or seeking excitement or something. And having like your persistent like well wishing your persistent like warmth and like encouragement has been like it's just sort of a recognition of like you know you can also just have this like <laughs> you you i mean i think i'm specifically thinking of like more like loving kindness the loving kindness direction um, but, but I guess it's sort of influenced me in a direction of like, you know, from a, from a, say, Vajrayana perspective, I'm like, I can paint with like literally any of the colors in the world. That's, that's what they're there for. I can paint with them. And from like the Tashant perspective, I'm like getting a sense of which colors are sweet to paint with. Mm -hmm. oh, that's sweet. Like that. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, it's probably. Mm. Just cool. The nice thing about having a friend of virtue is that when you have that kind of a friend, you can reflect to each other virtues that each of you can grow in, you know, it's not a yeah. one directional thing. So, well, uh, I also like the, the, the team effort part of this you know <laughs> like you know it just it makes me feel like i'm on on a team and plus mm -hmm. i've just experienced you know having difficult interactions with people who who's the way that they want to develop is more around skill or personal power or something and i like skills and personal power but um I guess one of the other things that's come from the like deep look at tragedy is just a, a, an unwillingness to contribute more to it. Like, like the tragic shit is already, already, already going to happen. Mm. You don't need to like make the edges jagged, you know, mm. you can make it smooth. Yeah. Like you don't want to fuel the causes of tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Or like if, if you relate to it, there's like, there's sort of like almost an, an art to relating to it as well. And I think that virtues have, you know, something to do with it. And not just tragedy, also cool stuff. Like, you know, I, I think of virtues some, you know, in some ways a, a little bit like aesthetic choices. Mm. Like some people are picking the like, you know, dark, muddy choice. And I pick that sometimes too. Mm. Like I like, I probably you know, need to go hang out in the mud a little bit more or something. But um, yeah, it's like the color or the, the the nuance with which you do stuff. Do mm. Mm -hmm. mm. I love that description of mm. virtues as painting and different colors and you can choose a different combination and make I intentional choices about it. Yeah, I think I think this is also like pretty influenced by like Joe Edelman's stuff. Mm. Um, you think because of values. I mean, I guess I think of the more like in my head, I'm thinking more of values. Mm. Like, you know, I, I value like courage or something. And um, yeah, like they feel like adverbs. You know, you do something courageously or with courage. Mm. You know, you do something with love. You can't just do courage. You have mm -hmm. to do a thing in a courageous way. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know? So true. Or do a thing in a in a way that is imbued with loving kindness. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. 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 Interesting. Well, let's talk about your project. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me, I guess there's, there's, there's broadly two questions and maybe we'll dive a little deeper than this, but one is how do you see, what, what problems do you see in the field currently? Uh, and what are you currently planning to do about it? So, um, the field of psychiatry and mental health is very broad. And the area that I'm focusing on is much narrower, but still, still giant, um, which is the crisis system. So this is the system that responds or the um, collection of systems that respond if someone's if things start to become really dangerous um, and the reason why i care about this um, is because i think it's the point in someone's life or someone's experience of I'm going to call it mental health. I actually, I prefer the term psychic health, but psyches have sort of fallen out of favor. Mm. Um, to me, psyche is a bit more integrated. Um, but you, you're meeting someone at the point at which there's tremendous energy and something has to happen, mm. right? Mm. Like something, you know, they've gotten to a point where, um, you know, either their mind has become so disorganized that things are dangerous or they are feeling so overwhelmed that they want to try and end their lives. And, and so like there's energy in the situation there. And I think that that is an opportunity um, to make changes that doesn't exist in the same way as um, when someone's in a karma everyday state. Um, and the second reason I care about it is because it's pretty non-optional. Like I, I've been, I don't know, I want to say like 60% of the way towards like the sort of situation where you might need to get involved with these people. I, you know, it's hard to say exactly, maybe less, maybe like 40%. And my luck has really come down to the, the things I've had available to me, like the spiritual teachers, the um, friends, um, the training, the time. Um, and for a lot of people who get involved with the system, it's extremely out of it's not just out of their control, but it's not what they or anyone else involved wants to happen. And it's also not, um, it can sort of like backfire and, and it can, you know, things can escalate as a result of it being so like introducing this, this conflict. Um, and, and I care about it. Um, I mean, it was, it was very key in the way that my brother related to the mental health system. He, um, I'm, I think he probably interacted with an emergency services person, bringing him to somewhere at least six or seven times. Um, and I think that for pretty much everyone who interacts with it, it's, it's an opportunity it's an opportunity for something to change. And currently it's an opportunity for someone to be controlled in a way that often makes them regret using it um, or them or the people they care about that, that care about them. Um, and the question of what I'm going to do about it. Um, well, so we've already or, already discussed the uh, extensive professional Googling and interviewing mm. that I've been doing for the last several months, um, which 
has been really orienting. It's been really just like trying to understand the question of like, what even are these systems? Who's involved in them? What do they do? What keeps them in place? Um, and I have an intention to help a better version of this experience emerge. And I, not only do I not have the like, the precise route to getting there, I don't, I think that that's, that's very naive. Um, I think for such a complex system, um, if there was a, if there was a route you could draw on a map, someone in would have done it already. Um, and so at the moment I'm trying a few different things. The first is trying to get clear on what I actually think it, the, the better option should be like, like if you think of this as just steering, this is like putting the coordinates in and the GPS. Um, and then trying to figure out if that is, um, like tr trying to find the other people for whom this is, is what they want. Um, because actually I think one of the under uh, understood aspects of this system is that with every crisis, there is almost always a conflict and there are at least two, if not more parties who want different things. Um, so incorporating that into a vision of like what actually might happen instead is like pretty, it's been pretty important to me. And then the second thing is to have this, I would call it like specialty agnostic approach to finding possible leverage points and building a team of people who can take advantage of those both at the smaller scale in the Bay area, but then, you know, ideally, in some of the bigger federal systems that influence the, um, the system as well. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, at the moment I'm really trying to understand that, that vision. And, uh, I say this because, uh, I'm sort of cribbing something from Malcolm Ocean here. He says something like, um, negative, negative desire can't steer or, um, punishment can't steer that, it, you know, the thing that we have right now is really harmful and it, you know, people come out of hospital and then they, the suicide rates go up after they're immediately out of hospital. Mm. People really, um, are getting destroyed by the system that exists, but merely not wanting the system to be the way it is, doesn't get you, um, doesn't get you anywhere. It just gets you like a little bit less of that maybe. Um, and so, yeah, fleshing out this idea of like, what if this, what if we took the energy of a crisis and like understood it as a place of transformation instead? Um, yeah, I'm really trying to like understand what that looks like on a visceral level. Um, direct, you know, see if, if I can communicate it, see if people are also interested. And then there's, um, you know, finding people, um, who also want to join me, um, ideally a small team of people, uh, and ideally some, at least some people with more experience in the medical system than I have. Um, yeah, building that team is pretty important. And then the third thing is this experimental process of like finding leverage points, trying things to affect them finding leverage points, trying things to affect them. Mm. Um, you know, that's like, and that's in, in, in a lot of different parts. That's in like legal system. That's in the, um, hospital policy system. That's in like clinician training, a lot of different things. Insurance billing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of stuff on billing. <laughs> this is a very funny way. The universe has like psyoped me into like huh? actually caring deeply about <laughs> things that I otherwise would have hated working on. Uh -huh. um, it did be like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's great. It's, it's, this is the thing. Like I'm not, 
I am thrilled to tell people about how like, you know, the Medicaid update process works or something like it's, <laughs> it's insane how different things seem when the motivation is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How have you been going about finding specific leverage points like in general and what leverage points have you found for this, these systems in particular? Um, so I've been sort of roughly using as a guide Denala Meadows set of leverage points, mm -hmm. um, which if you have not uh, read it and you're listening to this podcast I ha and you've gotten this far, I would highly recommend you read it. It's Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in the System by Denala Meadows. Um, it's short. It's like five it's yeah. like five or 10 pages or something. I have, it's probably my most reread essay of all time. Mm -hmm. um, like in my entire life. Um, yeah, another way of framing this question is like, if, if you've read that, what did you, you Jess have to learn that like, wasn't in that essay or what, how have you gone about applying that? That's like, because I mean, that that's like actually applying that stuff is like, actually applying that stuff is very, is very hot. So, yeah. um, I'm still in the early stages of this. Um, I would say that what I'm trying to do now and aiming to do without being too precious about like which things I do first is pick something I would like to be different. Uh, see if I can get signals that it might change. Um, and then do the thing that I think might change it. Um, and then see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. so like an example of this that is not going well is, <laughs> um, uh, I found out that Alameda County has been investigating making a, an old jail into a mental health facility. Mm -hmm. And I don't know all of the details about this yet, but I do know that on a basic level, jails are like laid out in a way that's like pretty bad for thriving as a person mm -hmm. and i you know if we're based this on like are you making this a space for like compassionate transformation like no mm -hmm. making a jail into a mental health facility is is not intrinsically a bad idea yeah and and i'd be open to changing but that's my current uh, my current guess is is this is not a good plan and it's also a fairly high leverage thing to uh, intervene in because facilities only get opened every so often like mm -hmm. and once they're open they're open you know and like, they treat many 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 people yeah um so i've been trying to understand like essentially can i have any influence on the course of this project mm. um currently getting blunted by complete lack of response from the county um mm. But uh, I, I can't even necessarily verify that this project is, is still happening. Mm -hmm. um, but like the, I'll put at least a little bit more effort into figuring out this, um, you know, whether this happens mm -hmm. uh, or whether this is happening. And, and also like uh, who the right people are to talk to and, and uh, can like what, what would be necessary to, to persuade them otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, another example is uh, i've been doing a bunch of deep dives on the peer respite um movement and so peer respites are alternatives to being locked in a hospital uh, in a psych ward that are often run by people who've had their own mental health challenges um and uh are very home-like like they're generally in a house or something and, and what are some of the names of these kinds of programs that have run um, so there's one in, um, Alameda County called Sally's place. Mm. There's one in Santa Cruz mountains or in Santa Cruz called, uh, second story. Um, it's the third one in the Bay. I can't remember. Um, there's a website called peerrespite.net, which if it's still up, we'll have a list of all of the peer respites. Otherwise, the National Empowerment Center um, has a list of peer respites worldwide. Not worldwide, sorry, US-wide. Um, 
So one of the things I've been under, I've been researching and um, trying to see if there are any like leverage points here is understanding what like leads a peer respite to essentially like survive or not mm. over time. Um, and so I'm not quite ready to like have a, a project or anything yet, but there's a, there's a potential project that's in the direction of, um, working to develop, I'd say a set of supportive resources or just like support in general for leaders of peer respites for the things that reliably show up as problems in all, um, in all these projects. So like they all have problems with funding um, and they all have, it seems like similar problems with funding uh, not fitting in particular ways. And so um, there's a possibility of uh, helping them improve at that. Mm. That would be an example of um, something else. So there's, there's sort of like a collection of leverage points where if you move that leverage point you make a small improvement to the mainstream system. Mm -hmm. And there's another set of leverage points where if you make a small improvement, you take away a barrier or a, or a bottleneck block or something to alternatives being developed. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, the, the example with the funding um, skills or, or funding capabilities is an example of a um, unblocking a constraint. Mm -hmm. Um, to to the alternatives existing. Hmm. Yeah, I just want to reflect. Like, this has been a very winding conversation, and hopefully, the listener or watcher has been patient with that. But like, really, at this moment, I think <clears throat> I can say, and there's like ample evidence to suggest, like, why I'm excited about this project from that you're doing it because um, it's something that's needed you know, that I, you know, I've learned about from hearing from you, but also other things in my life where I'm like, yeah, this is, this is really needed. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not the, the approach that you are taking, you know, it's still early days, you're mm -hmm. still learning what you're going to do, but it's like fundamentally not naive in a way that it really could be. You know, um, I see a lot of people like, I am going to solve this problem and here's how I'm going to do it. And here's my step-by-step -step plan, which as you say, it doesn't really work for complex systems. And a system skills, knows you're coming. Yeah, exactly. It can smell you. It can smell you. And um, and the solutions are not obvious. Like mm. they're they're not something you can anticipate or predict ahead of time. And you have to discover them iteratively. And so I think that you're bringing like, well, it may be, maybe like three things I think are really essential to what you're bringing to the table is like, yeah, a systems view on things, right? We were just talking about also like the humility to do research and look at what's worked and what's not in the past and learn from that. And then also, to me, this is this is essential. I, I don't know that this would be essential to other people, but it, to me, it's like just straightforwardly needed is like someone who is psychologically, emotionally, spiritually integrated enough to be able to do this kind of work and be resilient for a long time. And so, and like have the skills to approach it and um, not only uh, do the work, but also like be fulfilled and delighted by it and like enjoy it and not get wrecked by it. And you and know, I'm yeah. not, you know, and I think I'm pretty clear that I'm not yet the person who has the, the all of the traits. Of course. I'm just sort of committing to the process of becoming that person. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, maybe that's it too, is, is just the, 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 the motivation and the drive I've seen you have over the last year to like work on this is, is needed for this kind of a problem. Um, so, you know, you have my... Uh, support and best wishes and my skills. And I'm hoping that that is reflected through this conversation to whoever is watching or listening, that this is, this is a special project that, that deserves support, you know? Yeah. Um, can you say how, so, say someone's watching this or listening to this and they're, they're excited. They're like, this needs to happen. Mm. What, what kinds of help do you need at this time, at this juncture for your project? So, I think that the two things, there are two things in tandem that are highest priority. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is 
I want to have a team mm -hmm. of people that I'm working with. And at the moment, that team could be, it could be one. I mean, I have a lot of like advisors, but um, the sort of people that I'm looking for um, have the, th one of the things that I, I lack, which is the experience of having worked in the system and maybe tried a lot of stuff. Um, and, and ideally been up close with crisis response, like day after day. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, as well as the ability to connect with government, um, like uh, to, to build relationships within like government departments and things like that. Um, the thing that would make the most difference to the trajectory of this project right now is having the right person or, or people, mm -hmm. um, in those like like joining me and, and i think and, i'm and you and i have talked about some like specific roles that they might look like like what are those roles like broadly well um the the one that's that feels key is something like a co-founder um like a, i would say clinical co-founder someone with a lot more of that clinical experience um and then beyond that um there are quite a lot of needs, but I'm more interested in um, developing like a group of people that the sum of the group has has the right needs, uh, mm -hmm. has the right skills. Um, so I'm, I'm also particularly interested in people who have um, deep skills and knowledge in marketing because I think mm -hmm. that that is, is going to be a pretty high priority. Um, not necessarily for our project, but for uh pro projects that we like launch mm. um or, or for other programs that we're helping with um and but i think that like these roles are much more generalist mm -hmm. like uh in the sense of um I can't tell you what the, these people's job description will be in a mm. few months or a year. Um, and I can't tell you what my job description will be in a, a few months or a year. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to um, find uh, a pe person or, or people who have that like taste for uncertainty mm -hmm. that I've sort of spent a while describing abstractly, but I, I also mean... Um, I'm also referring to as a, like in business. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, I think that that like if if you're listening to this and this sounds like you, um, then please email me um, mm -hmm. and we can talk. And if you're listening to this and this sounds like someone you know, then please ag aggressively. Uh, <laughs> drag them to come talk to me, I guess, or, or... And, and just humor me here. Like, I, I hear that you want a generalist type team that like is adaptable and flexible and that what's needed will be uncertain and changing. And like, say you were putting out a job description, you need a clinical co-founder. What are some other roles you might like to hire for that are like fit in boxes that aren't maybe as adaptable or, or like, you know, you, you could actually fudge it quite a bit, but depending on the person, but like, if you were to put out a job description, what would the other roles be? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, there's probably someone who's like a, I would call them like a director of partnerships or something. Mm -hmm. um, so someone who's primarily building relationships within government and also within nonprofit organizations. Um, uh, there's potentially um, a researcher mm -hmm. um, or someone who's more, more academic than I and is able to do um, more like relate to the research uh, rather mm -hmm. than doing so things like meta-analyses and stuff um uh as i mentioned marketer um uh particularly to do with things like google advertising and, mm -hmm. and just google search in general um mm -hmm. uh there's a lot that has not been utilized in the realm of like 
helping people when they're asking for help on the internet mm. like, like helping people get the actual like like know what's available and stuff um mm. and then there's uh <clears throat> um it really depends on the projects but at least some of the projects that i'm working on or have planned um are more like they they require a sort of traditional tech um mm -hmm. set of skills um mm -hmm. It's more I language. well more I like product manager who can program mm -hmm. at the stage right right now rather than um than someone with like extensive niche programming I see. Uh, skill but like um you know someone who can do a lot of like prototyping and mm -hmm. stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah those are some of the yeah those are some of the skills. And was there another way that you need help besides identifying these people that you're alluding to? Um, yeah. So uh, if those people arrive to me today, today or tomorrow, I currently can't pay them. Mm. Um, I would like to. Mm -hmm. um, I have plans for how to use uh, money well uh, in service of this goal. And if you either have money you want to put towards this, um, making the system better, or you know of opportunities that I should be um, looking at, then I would love to know about that too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just maybe to make it explicit, because this is like, um, there are projects that, so this is just for me, for my, from, from like having done phrasing, that like a lot of the projects that I do right now, for example, are like, finite time bound projects where it's like oh you give me say five or ten or twenty thousand dollars and i can do mm -hmm. something good with it that's like a specific project right mm -hmm. and then there are projects where it's like oh we need a recurring budget of mm -hmm. this much and like yeah. we'll be able to do the thing yeah this project you're taking on at least to me from my mm. experience i could see you needing like be needing and being able to make good use of lots of yes. money because yeah, it's yeah. a systemic issue that you're trying to solve from multiple perspectives that like you you yeah. can't do with a ten thousand dollars or even like five years of a certain budget like you, you could i think over here you mm -hmm. it seems to me you can make good use of whatever money is available to be given to you so yeah i want to put that out um, explicitly for anyone watching and i think that the more um uh I'm ready to pull the trigger on hiring really good people, the mm -hmm. easier it is to make use of that money. That's I actually me. did, did uh, think of a, a third thing, um, which is uh, I very strongly prioritize um, like role models or inspiration or envisioning things. Um, like I do think that um, if you don't quite know where you're going, you're not going to get there. And uh, one of the things that I want is for this organization to be absolutely as good as it can be on the pragmatic level, mm. like on the level that everyone else has done before. Um, and in particular, things like um, hiring processes or um, uh, fundraising processes or anything like that, if you know of someone who you think is absolutely the best in the world, like, you know, top 10, 20 people in the world at one of the key components of running a really uh, high impact nonprofit, then tell me who they are. Mm. <laughs> because even if I can't, you know, even if, even if we, uh, I don't connect with them, I can at least learn um, from example. them. Um, right. So yeah, that's one of the things that I'm definitely really um, prioritizing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, we've covered a tremendous uh, amount of material and territory. Is there anything else that you'd like to say or talk about? Um, no. Okay. Well, I so appreciate your time and, and really, as I said, you have my best wishes and support for this project and I'm looking forward to seeing how it evolves and what directions you take with it. So thank you for all the good work you're doing. Thank you. Should I add my email or put that in the oh, show notes? 
maybe I'll put your the new sub stack that you created in the show notes for people. Yeah. 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 Cool. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jess. Thank you.